Mr. President, I would also ask unanimous consent to speak as if in morning business for up to 20 minutes. Objection so ordered. Mr. President, I'm rising this afternoon to talk about the Medicare program, which of course is a lifeline, a guarantee for 50 million older Americans. And in particular, what the Senate wants to do is make sure that those older people have access to primary care doctors, nurse practitioners, specialists, and other providers in their local communities because they provide critically needed care to our seniors day in and day out. Now, Mr. President and colleagues, many of those seniors have no idea that by March 31st, just a few weeks from now, the Congress has to act on their behalf to preserve access to the care the seniors depend on. And suffice it to say, those providers would much rather be delivering the care than waiting for this Congress to act. Now, fortunately, Mr. President, there's a roadmap for getting this done. And getting good care to seniors, not just for a short period of time, but colleagues once and for all. And I want to this afternoon urge my colleagues to seize this opportunity. And in beginning my remarks, Mr. President, I want to be clear that I can take little credit for the opportunity that is before us. The path that got us here, that got us started in the effort to make the needed reforms to protect our seniors is a direct result of the leadership of my friend and colleague, Senator Orrin Hatch. Just as Senator Hatch has done so many times over the course of an illustrious career, Senator Hatch was key to forging a bipartisan solution to a challenging, long-standing problem. So what I'd like to do, Mr. President, begin, in beginning, is recognize that effort by Senators Hatch, my predecessor as Chairman of the Finance Committee, Senator Baucus, House Ways and Means Chair Dave Camp, House Ways and Means Ranking Member Senator Levin, House Energy and Commerce Chair Fred Upton, and House Energy and Commerce Ranking Member Henry Waxman. The work that they have been doing over the last few months, in my view, is exceptional. And in effect, they've given us the opportunity to take this flawed system of setting a kind of Medicare budget known as SGR, the Sustainable Growth Rate. They've given us the opportunity to repeal and replace this flawed system with one that I think is going to make a huge difference in the days ahead by pushing the goal of good quality, affordable care up and doing it in a bipartisan way. And I hope that these colleagues will take it as a compliment that the SGR bill now before the Senate incorporates all of that good bipartisan work that they've been doing along with the work that was done on the Senate Finance Committee. I see our colleague from North Carolina here who has contributed mightily to that effort. Of course, the President of the Senate, uh, Senator Brown, who has been such an eloquent uh, spokesperson, particularly for those without political power and political clout, and I thank both of them for their efforts. Now, to be specific, the legislation that I introduced last night incorporates what those six members agreed to, the six members that I just named, the three Democrats and the three Republicans, came together with S-2000 and, in effect, that legislation, along with the health extenders passed by the Senate Finance Committee in S-1871, is essentially what we have the opportunity to move in the days ahead. Every single thing in this bill has had strong bipartisan support, and I hope that we can all come together and with resounding bipartisan support get this bill passed before March 31st. Now, there are a variety of reasons why Democrats and Republicans, in my view, 
can band together and repeal and replace what, again, I have characterized as a flawed, really dysfunctional system that we have today known as the SGR. But before I go through the list of reasons, I want to make clear to my colleagues and colleagues who've known me, I'm interested in sound, sensible policy, that we move in a bipartisan way, not politics, not message, but sound policy. And that's why I'm here on the floor uh, today. I've always tried to make it possible for both sides to secure their principles, principles that are important to them, and still allow us to go forward in a bipartisan and innovative fashion to get things done. And I will say to my colleagues, it is not possible any longer to just put one patch or another up and say we're going to fix the Medicare challenge. It's just not going to work. Now, for the last 10 years, Congress has always blocked these cuts. So I would say I think it's time to stop pretending that these upcutting cuts fittingly scheduled for April Fool's Day are any more real than the 16 other times that the Congress has intervened. What we ought to do, colleagues, is stop playing Medicare make-believe. It's time to set aside a flawed uh, formula that prevents the Congress from really moving ahead constructively on Medicare and to start with a clean slate. I thought the Wall Street Journal editors really summed it up very well on February 19th. What they said in talking about the bipartisan bill that I laud uh, tonight, the editors of the Wall Street Journal said, and I quote, simply pass the bill as is and forego the pretense of fake paying for it. Colleagues, think about those words. The editors of the Wall Street Journal basically said that this is all a bunch of fakery because the cuts aren't going to be made, the savings aren't going to be realized because we've tried that uh, route. And the Wall Street Journal said, pass this good bipartisan bill. Now, if the Congress fails to fully repeal the flawed Medicare payment formula now, I believe there will be cuts to other providers, hospitals, home health care providers, drug companies, skilled nursing facilities. Make no mistake about it. Those providers are going to be the ones who pay for yet another patch. So a lot of this budget fakery isn't real. But the people who are going to pay for the patch, they are going to face very real cuts. Now, in total, the 16 Band-Aid patches have already cost $150 billion. Colleagues, that is the same cost as fully repealing and replacing the flawed SGR plus taking care of the health extenders. And those cuts, as I've indicated, have largely been paid for in the past by cuts to other providers. In the last two years alone, the hospitals have forced have been forced to produce nearly $30 billion to pay for the temporary patches. Under the status quo, the SGR will always call for cuts that are too steep for providers to bear, and Congress will step in with yet another patch paid for by still more cuts to other providers. How can you make a case for more of the same, especially when you have an opportunity to not only repeal the flawed formula, but also to enact reforms that finally move Medicare away from the flawed fee-for-service approach that rewards quantity instead of quality and value. Second, I offered the Medicare SGR Repeal and Beneficiary Access Improvement Act of 2014 in order to eliminate the ongoing threat to our seniors and the providers who serve them. Under this legislation, which reflects the bipartisan, bicameral legislation that Senator Hatch and Senator Baucus offered last month, physicians would receive annual payment increases of 0.5% for five years. For the following five years, physicians would not receive automatic increases, but rather would be eligible for payment increases based on performance. Medicare would transition to a new focus on greater quality 
value, and accountability. This legislation would strengthen Medicare physician payments in a number of ways. It would reward the quality of care. It would remove, improve payment accuracy, expand the coordination of care for patients with chronic care needs, and encourage participation in alternative models of payment. And the bill addresses other critical Medicare and Medicare issues. They're known as health care extenders. And with these extenders, it would be possible for the Congress on a bipartisan basis to ensure that low-income seniors can have affordable Medicare premiums and guarantees that beneficiaries will have access to the therapies they need. Under the bill, rural beneficiaries will have the security of knowing that the hospitals and physicians will be there when they need them. And I know that rural health care for my friend from North Carolina, for my friend from Iowa, from the senator from Ohio, it's a priority for them. You pass this bill, which was put together by a bipartisan group in the House and Senate, and you give a big, big boost, colleagues, for rural health care and the services that seniors uh, depend on under Medicare. And finally, something I'm especially proud of, because Senator Grassley was good enough to work with me uh, for a number of years on it, is this would significantly expand Medicare transparency. This legislation would open up Medicare's treasure trove of payment data, and patients would have the information they needed to make informed choices about their care. And researchers and professionals will have the data needed to develop evidence-based medicine. So this afternoon, in addition to thanking colleagues that I've already uh, mentioned, I want to thank Senator Grassley for all those years in working with me. And as Senator Harkin knows, Senator Grassley has been a strong, strong advocate for transparency in health care and other vital services. And you see his good work in this bill. Now, this bill is bipartisan, Mr. President. It doesn't cut providers or increase cost sharing for the seniors. And I defer to my colleagues to decide if it's better to offset costs of SGR repeal by reducing future war spending or unpaid for. But the bottom line is the same. We ought to act now. Act now and put this flawed formula known as the SGR, which has produced Medicare migraines for frustrated providers and seniors alike. Let's put this behind us. Every single thing in the bill that I offer today has had, had strong bipartisan support, and it represents a compromise. Now, I know that this isn't an easy vote for colleagues on either side of the aisle, but I'd submit it sure means that we'll be able to accomplish what we were sent here to do, to find a way to do what's best for seniors and the doctors who care for them. And with that clean slate, and I've enjoyed talking to the President of the Senate about this because I think what this bill is all about is doing what's right for seniors, doing what's right for the doctors, setting in place a plan for the future that ensures seniors are going to get better care that in many instances will cost less. And that's what I hope senators will take home after we uh, break tomorrow for uh, the work period, that this is a chance to do what's best for seniors, what's best for doctors, and what's going to pay off for taxpayers in the long run. Nobody wins with Medicare make-believe. And after these 16 patches, when you have the Wall Street Journal editors joining with seniors and providers, and you have a bill that has strong bi bipartisan support, I think this is the kind of measure that senators ought to uh, flock to. And I'll just close by saying we all know that the public is frustrated with a fair amount of what happens uh, here in the Congress. And there's a fair level of disappointment. Uh, the senator from North Carolina and I were talking about a variety of issues on this point uh, this morning. 
But I look around this chamber and I see senators who have spent a significant amount of time in public life and a number of colleagues are on the floor. I am old enough to remember joining them in the other body before uh, we came here. And we're here for a purpose. We're here to get things uh, done. And on this Medicare issue, which suffice it to say, Mr. President, has been one of the most polarizing in the American public debate. In fact, I'd venture to say on the domestic side of the budget, there are few issues that have been as divisive and polarizing as Medicare. This is an opportunity, colleagues, to check the partisanship at the door, come together and set in place a new system of paying providers under Medicare that is going to produce better quality at lower costs. We ought to support it in a bipartisan manner. And with that, Mr. President, I yield the floor.